Hi. In the previous video, I talked a bit about the phenomena of a skin effect, and I showed you how to perform simple simulation in Compson Multiphysics to analyze uh, skin effect phenomena. Now, in this video, I'm going to discuss uh, two common explanations that are used uh, to justify why a skin effect should happen. Now, both of these explanations are not uh, complete and I will show you what kind of deficiencies they have. Uh, in the next video, I will use mathematical reasonings to explain exactly why a skin effect should happen. Now, let us start with the first explanation. So assume that we have a conductor and the current is flowing upward in this conductor. We're going to look at the cross-section of this conductor. So here's the cross-section, the current is flowing upward, and if you look at the magnetic field, obviously following the right-hand rule, in the right side of the axis symmetry, the magnetic field goes into the page. In the left side, the magnetic field comes out of the page. Now, let us assume that as time goes on, the current magnitude is increasing. And also here, I consider uh, a loop of uh, conductor within this uh, conductor, because this area is all conductor. Here, I consider it a loop. Now what happens is that as, as current magnitude is increasing, so obviously the intensity of magnetic field also increases. Okay, so basically what we have here is that um, the intensity of this magnetic field increases. So when we have a changing magnetic field, uh, according to further induction law, a voltage will be induced on this loop. But because this loop is shorted, the induced voltage will create a current that flows through this loop. Now, what is the direction of that current flow or that induced voltage? Basically, the direction is in such a way that induced magnetic field tries to oppose the change of the magnetic field. Now, because the magnetic field is inside the page here and it is increasing, so the induced magnetic field should be outside the page because it wants to oppose the change of the magnetic field. So in this case, if we add these two together, the change of magnetic field will be very small. So what kind of current flow into this loop would create that outside magnetic field? Um, that current distribution should be, current flow should be in that direction. Now the same way we can say that in the left side, the current distribution, the current induced should be in that way. All right, so if now I look at the total current distribution and this conductor, so obviously we have a current I that flows everywhere, but now we have an induced current into this uh, conductor, and we can see that the direction of induced current is opposed, opposite to the direction of the original current in the center, and uh, it's actually the same direction of the original current near to the edges. So basically near to the center, we will have less mag the less magnitude of current, and as we move toward the edge of the conductor, the magnitude of current will be more. That is basically used to explain um, why a skin effect uh, phenomena happens. Now, everything is very good and excellent if you just stop here. However, if you look at uh, the scenario a bit more critically, then you will realize that um, there are some other cases. And in the second case, basically, the direction of current still is upward, but as time goes on, the magnitude of current is decreasing. So same as before, the, the magnetic field in the right side of the axis symmetry is into the page, uh, the left side of the axis symmetry is coming out of the page, and we consider this loop. Now in this case, because I is decreasing, the magnetic field is also decreasing the intensity. So basically, according to Faraday induction law and Lenz law, we see that um, because the intensity of magnetic field in this loop is decreasing now, so the induced magnetic field should actually support this magnetic field because it doesn't want to have any change. Now this is decreasing, so induced magnetic field will also try to help it such that the total magnetic field does not change. So if we have that, that is the induced magnetic field, which type of current will create this induced magnetic field if the direction of current is in this way? 
and the same way for the other one the direction of current should be in this way well now if you look at the total current distribution we realize that near to the center of conductor this induced current will actually support the original current and near to the edge the induced current is opposed to the direction of the original current so what we will see is that we will have more current close to the center and as we move toward the edges we will have less current so this is completely opposite than what we think about the skin effect because in this case actually the current in the center becomes more okay so we realize that this explanation commonly only this part is given and we say up to here and we say that is why the skin effect should happen but this explanation is not really complete explanation of course it gives very uh, strong reasoning uh, why um, using very simple principles to to explain what happens to the current uh, induced current which basically adds to the original current and so sort of subtracted from the original current but it's not uh, really a complete explanation for the skin effect okay so this is enough for the first method now i'm going to talk about the second method all right so the second method that uh, is commonly used to explain the phenomena of a skin effect is as follow so let us consider a conductor we we are going to divide the cross section of this conductor into a number of uh, sections in such a way that the area of these sections are equal so here a0 is equal to the area of this tube is equal to the area of that tube and so on now let us assume that we apply a voltage uh, over the length of this conductor. Now what we can do is that we can actually model this uh, conductor with number of uh, resistances and inductances. So the intersection, we can model it like this. So the intersection has a resistance R0 and inductance of L0 and it's parallel with the first tube which is here. So it's the resistance is R1, the inductance is L1 and so on. And the voltage is applied over the length of this conductor, which means it's parallel with these branches. Now, first, let us look at the steady state DC. Uh, at the steady state DC, obviously, the inductances will be shorted, so we do not have them. So it's only the resistances. But we know the formula of DC resistance is length divided by sigma A. But because our assumption, we said that the area of these sections are equal, so the area of the first section is equal to the second section and so on. So the resistances, the DC resistance will be equal. So in case we apply a DC voltage across this conductor, we realize that these are all same resistances. So the current will flow equally in each section. So basically the current distribution will be uniform across the cross section of this conductor. Okay, so this model that we have uh, explained so far, it works fine uh, under DC. Now under AC, a steady state AC, I'm going to show you that if we have this assumption that uh, the areas are equal of these sections, then I will show that the in inductance of the inner section is larger than the inductance of the first tube and is larger than the inductance of the second tube and so on. So then what happens? In this case, we can actually define an impedance. So the impedance of the first part is R0 plus J omega L0 because now we apply a, a sinusoidal voltage which has some frequency. So the impedance of the inductor is J omega L. And then the second one is R1 plus J omega L, L1 and so on. But because we, we are going to show that L0 is larger than L1 is larger than L2 and so on, we can conclude that the magnitude of the impedance Z0 is larger than the magnitude of impedance Z1 and is larger than the magnitude of impedance Z2 and so on. So if that is the case, because this voltage is parallel with these impedances, so obviously the current through the first section or to, through the section 0 is less than the current through section 1 and is less than through the current section 2 and so on. So based on these, we prove that the current in the inner section is less and the current as we go to toward the edge of the conductor the, the current is more okay so now this is basically the task that i have if the cross sections are equal the areas are equal i will show that this this statement is true now i also i have to make another assumption and that is basically the current through each of these sections are uniformly distributed so if I take only section A0, then 
um, the current is uniform here and also in A1 the current also is uniform there. This assumption is very soft and we can easily fulfill this by just increasing the number of these sections. So instead of here I put only four sections, we can put maybe thousands of sections and then we are sure that within each section the current density is more or less uniform. Okay, so now the first step is that I want to find the radius of uh, all of these uh, sections that we have created. Because we assume that the areas are equal, so let's, let's find the radius of the first tube. So if I consider the radius is m, so I know that the total area of these, pi m2, minus the area of the inner part, it gives me the area of that tube. And the area of that tube should be equal to the area of the centerpiece, which is pi a2. So out of this, you just eliminate pi, you take the a the other side and simplify, you get m is equal to a square root of 2a. So the first tube, actually the radius is a square root of 2a. And a is the radius of the centerpiece. Now if we do the same trick for the second tube, we see that the inner radius is a square root of 2a, because that is the radius of the first tube, the outer radius of the first tube. And so pi m2 minus pi, uh, we want to subtract the whole surface here, a square root of 2a power 2, which then basically, again, you simplify this and you calculate m is a square root of 3a. So basically we conclude that for the first section, for the inner section, the radius is a, for the first tube, the radius is a square root of 2a, for the second tube, the radius is a square root of 3a, and so on. These are the auto radius. Now if we take the section n, a n, these are all the tub tubular sections. So the inner radius will be a square root of n a, and the outer radius will be a square root of n plus 1 a. All right, so this is easy. So now I'm going to uh, show that the inductances is uh, as we claim. Okay, so now I'm going to calculate the inductances. For the centerpiece, which is a solid conductor, the inductance calculation is actually available everywhere on the internet. You can find the formula. Usually what we do is that we divide the inductance into two parts. One is the internal inductance and one is the external inductance. So we have LN and external inductance. We can show easily that internal inductance is mu0 divided by 8 pi and external inductance is mu0 divided by 2 pi L and D over A. Now this D is an imaginary boundary that I consider uh, far from this conductor. Now if we extend this D to infinity, basically what happens is that the inductance of a single conductor will be infinite. So usually we have to consider some boundary somewhere and limit the total energy within this, uh, this boundary. Uh, so these formulas, as I said, is available everywhere over the internet, so just search for it. Now at first stage, I'm going to show you the external inductance of all these sections that we uh, assumed. So for the centerpiece, we said that this is the formula. For the first tubular section, the inductance will be mu0 divided by 2 pi L and D over a square root of 2A. Because here we have the radius, the outer radius is a square root of 2A. And for the next piece will be a square root of 3a. So it will be divided by a square root of 3a and so on. Now why I use these formulas directly here and I just replace the radius here? Because um, when we want to calculate the external inductance, everything is very simple. Because the magnetic flux will be linked with the total amount of current available in these conductors. And because we assume that uh, these currents, uh, when we want to do analysis, we assume a current I here or a current I here. So basically, the magnetic flux will be linked with the, with the total amount of current. So when we do the integration, we actually have to integrate from this outer um, radius till the point D. So the formula that we have here in the first case will be exactly the same as the formula that we have here and for any of these cases. The only thing that will change is the, the inner radius, which in this case will be a square root of 2a, the next case will be a square root of 3a, and so on. Now, Okay, so we have found already the external inductances. We can easily observe that as we move from the centerpiece toward the outer piece, um, the, the radiuses of obviously is increasing. So this denominator value is increasing. When the denominator increases, it means that the total value will decrease. So basically what, what, I, what I have shown right now is that the external inductance of the centerpiece is larger than the external inductance of the first tube is larger than the external inductance of the second tube, and so on. 
All right, so we have shown that the external inductances is the same way as we wanted to, to prove. Now I'm going to show you that this behavior is also true for the internal inductances. Okay, so now I'm going to calculate internal inductance for, um, uh, for a tubular shape. The inner radius is a screw root of n a, and the outer radius is a screw root of n plus 1 a. And now I consider an, a boundary here, which is um, this radius is x. We are going to calculate the magnetic uh, flux inside this uh, tubular shape and calculate the linkage flux, and eventually calculate the inductance. OK, so we start with the. Uh, so this, this is the flux linkage, which we want to calculate at the end. So we start with the Ampere's law. So we say that curl of H is equal to the current density. So we basically use the Stoke theorem for this surface that we have and convert these um, curls into the integrals. So basically what we get is that uh, H dot DL is equal to the total current that is inside here. So it would be basically the the integral of um, of j, which would be i inside. So then I write it again. So the integral of h dl, basically we are moving over this uh, circle now, and the distance, the radius is x, so we have 2 pi x time h will be equal. So what is i inside? What is the current that is inside this? So we have to calculate this amount of current, basically, which will be pi uh, pi x2 minus pi a square root of n a power 2. This is basically the area here divided by the total area. Total area is pi a square root of n plus 1 a power 2 minus pi a square root of n a power 2. This multiply i. This is basically the current that we have inside. Okay, so 2 pi x time h is equal to pi disappears. This one power 2 is n plus 1 a2 minus n a2. So that will be a2 only. So we have basically a2. And then here we will have x2 minus n a2 time i. All right, so then it's simple. So I can calculate h, h over this uh, basically circle. So it will be 1 over 2 pi x time x2 minus n a2 divided by a2 multiply i. So I can calculate b then. Magnetic flux density will be mu divided by 2 pi x x2 minus n a2 divided by a2 time i. And of course, now I can calculate the basically magnetic flux. So magnetic flux I can calculate over, let's say, this distance, let's say. We take it over this distance, and then this is dx. This little piece will be dx. So then what I can write is that um, phi will be uh, like d phi will be mu divided by 2 pi x, x2 minus n a2 divided by a2 times i dx. Now you should remember that uh, obviously the phi, we have to, this, this tube is basically expanded in that direction. So the phi will be we are calculating over the whole area here. So there is an x and there is a lengthwise, but then we consider that this d phi and everything is per meter. So actually everything here, I just put some with other color, but everything is actually per meter. So eventually the inductance that we, we calculate will be per meter. All right, so this is basically d phi that we, we calculated now. But then we have to calculate the linkage flux. So what this uh, this flux, the uh, magnetic flux that we have, is only linked with the 
with the amount of current we have inside this uh, section. So it's only linked with this amount of current. So basically, in order to calculate the linkage flux, I have to multiply. Let me change the color. So D lambda will be equal to this amount of current. But we have already calculated that amount of current is this ratio. Basically, X2 minus NA2 divided by A2 multiply mu divided by 2 pi x x2 minus n a2 divided by a2 i dx all right so i have to be careful these are multiplication and this is x for me they are almost the same all right now let me i simplify i will come here so d lambda is equal take the constants out mu divided by 2 pi and then we have a2 a2 so this is a4 and then we have i also and what we have here is x2 minus n a2 power 2 divided by x dx okay so now i will integrate this uh, flux linkage from the inner radius of the of the tube till the outer radius so basically the total flux linkage lambda will be equal from a square root of n a till a square root of n plus 1 a and that formula mu i divided by 2 pi a4 x2 minus n a2 over 2 divided by x dx okay so i can bring this one out which will be equal to mu i divided by 2 pi a4 the integral and then this one let me i power 2 so this will be x4 um, plus n2 a4 and then minus 2NA2X2 divided by x, and then this is dx. So then this uh, and the total, let's say, is equal to mu i divided by 2 pi A4, and then here we have the integral. I can Okay, let me I do it step by step such that I don't want to make any mistake here. Nobody is going to tell me my mistakes. So then we have 2NA2X and DX, which then we conclude that lambda dot will be equal to mu i divided by 2 pi A4. And then we take the integration will be basically x4 divided by 4 plus n2a4 ln x minus na2x2. Okay, so then I have to actually evaluate this one from the square root of na till square root of n plus 1a. Okay, so let me I fix this. Okay. Let's use a different color. Red. So then the lambda will be basically equal mu i divided by 2 pi a4. And if I replace this x power 4, when I replace it with that, then what we get is basically n plus 1. Um, power 2a4 minus n2a4 divided by 4 plus n2a4 ln the square root of n plus 1 divided by n okay and then minus 
n a2 when we power 2 this would be n plus 1 a2 this would be minus n a2 so this is a2 okay so then what i have is that lambda would be ah oh, this is not good mu d, mu i 2 pi a4 time then we expand this and subtract basically you get um, 1 plus 2n divided by 4 a4 plus n2 ln a square root of n plus 1 n a4 minus n a4 okay so now we can simplify a4 from everywhere so a4 disappears so then i conclude that lambda will be equal to mu i divided by 2 pi and this n i can subtract from this 2 because so it's basically multiply 1 minus 2n divided by 4 plus n2 ln n plus 1 over n okay so then i have this one so we know that lambda is equal li so now i can calculate l will be mu divided by 2 pi mu 0 of course all of these are mu 0 um time 1 minus 2n divided by 4 plus n2 ln Okay, so for each section, I have shown you that um, basically this is the, the formula for internal inductance. Now this, this formula, uh, we are, I'm going to plot it in MATLAB and show you that this formula uh, is actually decaying. As n increases, this, uh, this inductance decreases. For the case of the first tube, let us compare the, the case of the first tube with, uh, with the centerpiece. Um, so the internal inductance of the L internal 0, it was mu 0 divided by 8 pi. This was for the first piece. But for the L internal number 1, we can replace it here actually. So we will have mu 0 divided by 2 pi, and then N is 1. So basically it's 1 minus 2, which is minus 1. So minus 1 over 4 plus n is 1 here so it would be ln a square root of 2 so which one of these two is larger so i claim that this one is larger than that let us see uh, so mu 0 over 8 pi i claim that this one is larger than this We can simplify these, of course. Now I'll use another color. These with these disappears basically. So I have to show that one over four is larger than minus one over four plus ln square root of two. Is this true or not? So I can bring that one to the other side. So basically one over two I have to show is larger than Screw root of 2. But of course, we can go also backward here. So then, this 1 over 2 I have to show is larger than 1 over 2 because this is 2 power 1 over 2, ln 2. And so I have to show that uh, 1 is larger than ln 2. But this is true because ln e is equal to 1. e is 2.71, so this is correct. So for the first part, I have shown that L internal 0 is certainly larger than N internal 1. And for the rest, I will plot this one in, in MATLAB, and I will show you that this one is a decaying function. Okay, so I have coded this uh, coefficient in MATLAB. And now if I plot it, you see that um, when the number of N increases, 
I3 disk coefficient decreases, which means that internal inductance of uh, the tubular sections that are closer to the edge of the conductor uh, is lesser than the inter internal inductance of um, tubular sections that are closer to the center of the conductor. So what we have shown so far is that um, this statement is true for both internal inductances and also for the external inductances of these sections. Because the total inductance is the addition of internal inductance plus the external inductance, so I can conclude that uh, the total inductance of the centerpiece is larger than the total inductance of the first tubular section and so on. So basically we completed our task and we have shown that this statement is true. Now we can go back and we observe that current in the centerpiece is lesser than current in the first tube, tubular section and so on. So by this we show that uh, the current in the tubular section that is closer to the edge of the conductor is actually the highest and that is the skin effect phenomenon. So now even though this proof is very solid and uh, it's built upon uh, let's say solid reasoning but still this proof is not complete so you might might ask why because last week when we did the numerical simulation we observed that obviously the current density near to the edge of the conductor is the highest and in the center is the is the least but um, we also observed that at certain region of the conductor in some cases the current can flow in the opposite direction of the main current flow. So for example, the total current coming out of the page, but at this region, the current goes into the page. This observation, obviously, we cannot have with this model. This model will not produce that result. This means that the model that we have made has some deficiencies, which uh, cannot predict the whole uh, picture. Now, because this video is very long already, I'm going to stop it here. But in the next video, I will solve Maxwell's equation uh, together and we will find the exact solution of current distribution for this cylindrical uh, conductor. And we will see that when we do um, mathematical analysis properly, we will actually find the exact solution that we see in the numerical calculation. Okay, bye.